Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Fantastic to see um, such a packed crowd. My guest tonight has been blown up. Uh, he's been shot. He's been buried alive. Uh, he even survived a stampede of water buffalo. I'm very honoured indeed to welcome Fergus Ancorn. <laughs> Hi, Fergus. Good to see you. Take a seat. So, Fergus, not much in your life then, really? No, no, it's been humdrum. Humdrum. <laughs> In, in fact, um, you were born on the 10th of December, 1918, you probably knew that, yeah. in um, uh, Duncton Green to Wilfred and Beatrice, your mother. Right. Um, you were one of four children, uh, in fact the youngest, you had a, a twin sister as well. Yes. Um, how much of that early days do you remember? 93 years next, next month, isn't it? Every bit of it. I can bring it all back to mind just as if it were yesterday. Excellent. Do you have particular fond memories of, of those sort of times? Well, I enjoyed my youth, uh, my young age, because everything in life was so perfect and happy that uh, I was just floating through life in, in complete happiness all that time. And you actually, from quite an early age, got into magic, uh, I understand. When, 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 do, when was your first magician that you saw? Well, I didn't see any magicians. I was the first to do it to me, and I didn't even know you could buy books on it. Right. So I taught myself magic. And on my birthday, my father gave me a little box of tricks from Davenport's Hospect. And I used to do these tricks, and my parents used to pretend they hadn't the slightest idea how they were done. Everyone in the room knew how they were done. <laughs> but I used to love to look at their faces, and that started me thinking, I must do this. So every birthday, I got another trick, until one day, um, the... Uh, I was called to the house of Major Branson, who was the Vice President of the Magic Circle. Right. He was in the Army, Indian Army. Every three years he got six months leave. And of course everyone was asking him, could you possibly come and do us a show? And sorry, but we haven't got any money. And I remember going, he called me to his house. And he said to me, uh, do me a trick then. So I did a wonderful trick. I don't suppose any of you know how it's done. I put a matchbox on here and it lifted up and then it opened, then it came down again. And he said, yeah, that's all right. What happens if the thread breaks? <laughs> I thought, how did he know there was a thread there? <laughs> and he said to me, look, forget all that. You're just spending money. Any trick you buy, anyone else in the country can buy it. Use these. And from that day on, I started sleight of hand. And the, the rest is history. And actually, you started very young with professional engagements as well, didn't you perform? Oh, yes, yes, I was doing that before the war. Uh, my first professional engagement was uh, for seven pounds, or seven guineas as it was in then. And that was getting more than my father was earning as a top Fleet Street journalist. No, oh, amazing. Um, and after school, um, you remember going to, um, obviously being called up during the war. Uh, where were you when war was declared? I was uh, at my home in Dunton Green when war was declared. And uh, we had just, I'd been called up before anyone else. My number was SGV1. And we had to do six months with the services to get ready for war. And uh, I went in very frightened because I'd heard about these nasty sergeant majors that swear at you and get you out of bed and all that. I didn't think I could put up with it, but I had to and I went in for my six months and I came out seven years and three days later. Right, right. And I think we, um, th what was the name of the regiment you were in? I was in the 118th Field Regiment, Royal Artillery. And th this is the uh, yes, evidence you wore? Yes, that's the badge of the Royal Artillery, or the cream as we call it. And one of the, the interesting things, which I didn't know before reading your several publications which were come to, is that they're all the same blood group, is that right? It was my uh, battery's idea, I don't know where they got it from, that every driver, I was a gun driver, had to be a gunner, you had to know how to lay a gun and fire it and all that stuff. And every gunner had to be a driver. And then they thought, why not let's get them all with the same blood group? 
Right. And so on our gun, uh, we were all in the same blood group. We could all take each other's places on the gun, and uh, the gunners could also drive the, the lorry if I got blown up, which I did. Right. And fairly shortly after joining, you actually got struck down with, with illness, and I understand you were um, in hospital for some time, uh, where you met uh, a nurse. That's Lucy. right. Well, I wasn't interested in girls, really, damn nuisance. Um, uh, I, I was an athlete. In fact, I was one of four men in Kent who could run a sub two minute half mile, which was something in those days. I can't do a sub two minute, 10 inches now. <laughs> but um, I was only interested in athletics and gymnastics and acrobatics and that sort of stuff. And I was in hospital one day and uh, with pharyngitis. And unfortunately, they put me in the wrong ward. It was a skin ward, and it was uh, fever, scarlet fever, which has three weeks incubation. And each three weeks, someone else got it. Right. So I was in there for months. <laughs> and uh, one day, we had a new nurse came on. And I had a friend in the next bed to me, and he said to me, are you uh, married or engaged or anything? I said, good Lord, no. And he said, what, not engaged? I said, no, are you never gonna get married? I said, no. If I am, it's gonna be to that nurse. And I'd seen her for the first time that day. Right. And that, as we found out, so yeah, that's on. what happened in the end. Absolutely. Yes. And you actually called her uh, in, as I say, in a number of your books, your, your greatest motivation Absolutely. Uh, for survival. Yes, without her, I would have been less than nothing. I'm not very good now, but still. <laughs> and you're actually quite a romantic, because even before the days of Tommy Steele, uh, you had, um, when you were posted off again, you took a, a half a farthing, wasn't it? Well, you see, I got engaged on the day of on our embarkation leave the day before I sailed and I hadn't got any money because uh, at that time in the army uh, my rank of gunner which is the same as private um, we got seven shillings and sixpence a week that's 37 and a half p and we had to make an allotment out of that to our friends and all the rest of it and I had no money and no savings nothing at all and um, so I thought, well, I can't buy a ring. So I went to a jeweler's and I got a new farthing. For those of you that don't know, four of those made a penny. Mm. And uh, got him to cut it in half. And uh, my fiance had half on a silver chain and I had the other half on the silver chain. And when I went away, I said, you know, I'll come back and then we can join it together. Right, right. And uh, you, end, uh, you subsequently posted to Liverpool, where I understand you started uh, your performance side for the, for the troops. Well, not, not so much as a performance. As it, whenever there was an opportunity, I'd get a pack of cards out and do something, you know. And uh, I, we did do the odd, bigger show, but I was always at it. I never stopped liking magic. And in the bigger shows, who, do you remember who else would be on the bill? Because actually I understand that virtually everybody who went through Liverpool would have seen you perform at some stage. Oh yes, because the, the whole of our army was up there waiting to go abroad. So they would all have seen these shows. Right. And do you remember what you used to perform in, in those shows? I don't really. I, I know it was sleight of hand. I know I did a, a card fanning thing, producing cards. And I used to start with, I would walk on producing lit cigarettes. I did that for many years. In fact, the last time I did it, was in a hospital for severely disabled children. And as soon as I produced the first cigarette, every alarm in the place went off, <laughs> the smoke. <laughs> Probably the parents objecting, wasn't it? I mean, it was a, producing cigarettes for children, what was that? Absolutely, well, the kids <laughs> liked it all right. Um, within no time at all, we had six fire engines around there. Right. <laughs> and that's the last time I did cigarette production with lit cigarettes. Right, right. Uh, eventually, after, after the several shows in, in Liverpool, um, and we, we'll come back to the effect of that later, um, you set sail uh, yes. for Singapore. Um, and tell me about that journey. Well, it was a, an amazing journey. Uh, to start with, we went across the North Atlantic, which was the most difficult place for submarines and dive bombers, 
and we were not allowed to take our clothes off or our boots off or anything because they were expecting the boat to go get hit and on that journey we had three corvettes and a destroyer to look after our convoy of over 200 ships it's an amazing sighting convoy wherever you look ships everywhere right. how they don't hit i don't know but um, we went to halifax nova scotia right through the north atlantic and i remember at one time i hadn't seen land for 21 days and it was very rough seas and i asked a member of the crew you know how far away is the nearest land right and he said up oh, to two and a three two three and a half miles something like that and I looked all around, I couldn't see any land, and I said, which direction? And he said, oh, that way. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so on, on the way to Singapore, you, you also stopped off in Bombay. Um, do you have very vivid recollections of that? Yes, I did. <clears throat> we went to Bombay. <clears throat> this is after many months. We were on that ship for three and a half months. And eventually into Bombay, and uh, I was in barracks there for some time. I think we were there three or four weeks. And I was in a barracks called Ahmed Naga. And that's the barracks where <coughs> Spike Milligan was born in those barracks. And we had the old magician turn up. And uh, <coughs> they just know one trick. <coughs> it's like the gully gully men. You know, they do the cups and balls and that's it. And when I started with my thimbles and things like that, it frightened the daylights out of them. <laughs> and I remember um, I went into the uh, kitchen area one day in Bombay, and there was the usual Indian loose waller doing the washing up right. for 150 of us in a bucket of cold water. 150, same bucket, bacon for breakfast. So you could scrape the sides off, you know. And I went across to him, and he looked at me and he said, Sahib, Sahib. I said, it's all right. And I put my hand into his back and came out with a lit cigarette. Right. And, he, and he said, no, no, Sahib, no, no, no. <laughs> and I walked away, and I went back two minutes later, and I said, you know, put another cigarette. <laughs> and he was frightened to such an extent that the third time I went, he said, no, no, Sahib, Sahib, and he ran away. <laughs> And I had to do the washing up. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, you were one of the more adventurous people in, in these different places. So I, I think in Bombay, they were also showing at that time a, a film. It was Puff the Magic Dragon. And, and your, your comrades didn't want to go and explore as much as you right. did. And they went to the cinema. Amazing thing. We were in Bombay for one day before we moved up country. We got off the ship after three and a half months at sea. And they all flocked into the cinema to see Puff the Magic Dragon, which they hadn't seen before. They probably thought it was Piff, that's why. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, so um, I didn't. I went walking around the town right. and got lost. No, and, and having got lost, eventually you got back to the ship on, on time. Um, and arriving in Singapore, I mean, it couldn't have been a worse time, could it? Oh, no. It, it, the, uh, the place was about to fall. In fact, it fell within seven days, and um, all that we had was bombings and shellings. And actually, after three and a half months at sea, we came down the gangplank being bombed and shelled, so yeah. it was a, straight into it. Okay, well, let, let, let me take you February, Friday the 13th, you remember it well, 1942, which was your last day of combat. Tell us what happened on that day. Well, um, Normally, your gun driver, that's me, has to deliver the gun and the crew and the ammunition and then clear off to the wagon lines, uh, three or four miles away, six miles perhaps. Um, and the reason is you don't want your lorry to be anywhere near the gun when it's being shelled. But on these occasions, the Japanese had a balloon up over the top of us with two Japanese officers with binoculars looking at us so we had to fire a few rounds and then get out of it and move off to somewhere else and of course so my lorry was right by the gun when it was firing I was next to it 
and our gun got hit and I was sent down to Singapore town to get another gun in the ordnance yard about 15 miles away and when I got there into the ordnance yard uh, should I say what sergeant, was the sergeant major? Of course. The sergeant major said to me you're from the 118 and I said yes but he said I've got a present for you and he gave me a shell fused ready to go off and I said I'm not taking it because I was alone and he said you are taking it I said no I'm not he said you are taking it that is an order and I said I'm not taking it and that is a fact <laughs> and I refused it but as I drove out of the gates he plonked it on my lap and so there was I driving along the road with a fused shell on my lap uh, waiting for trouble and uh, I mm -hmm. found it. Uh, the Japanese of course had mastery of the air. We had no uh, aircraft anywhere. So they used to fly around in 27 at a time, 3333, three, 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 looking for targets. And what did they see? They saw a lorry with a gun on the back of it going up Thompson Road, which is a long straight road, and uh, I, which we haven't mentioned at the moment, I've been bombed several times and lost friends, so I was terrified of being bombed, and I saw the people in front of me diving into the ditches and covering their heads up, and I thought, oh God, not more bombs, and I decided to get out of <coughs> the area. And I put my foot down and I headed out, hoping that I would be clear of the area when the bombs came. And I was looking out of my windscreen and uh, I thought what I will do, as soon as I actually see anti-aircraft shells bursting in, in the sky, I'll stop the and get out. But what I didn't know was that I was the target and the bombs were already on the way down when I was thinking all this. <coughs> they were coming along behind me. <coughs> so while I was looking up there, the bombs were on the way down. Next thing was I was in a whole mess of bombs, hundreds of bombs dropping all around me. And the bomb splinters <coughs> came inside my lorry. And the, the lorry looks very tough. If any of you get the book this evening, the photo of it in there. But in actual fact, it was made of biscuit tin. So all these uh, bomb splinters came in and couldn't get out. So they were flying around inside there and I was being hit everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And uh, when the last bomb landed, you check yourself. You, when you've been hit, you don't know, you've no idea no where you've been hit. It's just a throbbing body. And I started to check myself. And the first thing I thought of, where's the shell? And it was gone. And there was a hole in the back of my driving seat, that size. And I could see all the springs in there. And there was a hole in the roof, the same size. So that thing had gone from there through the back of my seat and out through there. So the next thing I did was to look at myself. <laughs> well, how did it get through the back of my seat? And it wasn't until later that I realised that, that when I was first, the first blast that hit me, my head uh, went forward onto the driving wheel. And at that moment it must have departed and uh, got out of it. Then uh, the lorry was on fire, of course, and uh, I had to get out. I could see that the door was jammed because it was like this and um, I could also see my two forearm bones poking out of my arm like this and uh, I went to open the door and I saw that my hand was hanging off just by skin and uh, I still had to get out. I was paralysed from here downwards and I managed to lie on the seats of the gunners because they're six abreast, right. big wide lorry, and I kicked the door open and jumped. Now I tell you, I was paralysed, it didn't make any difference to me, I was getting out of it. And I, while I was in mid-air, I was shot. 
Oh, it was Friday the 13th, by the way. <laughs> and uh, that brought me down. And I picked myself up and ran away like a frightened rabbit. This is all, but well, it's not working. It didn't make any difference to me. It's going to work tonight. And I ran away. And that's um, where I ended up. I was in a ditch. Right. And um, that's the lorry that I was in when it happened. And obviously, a lot of blood. There was a very, very se severe well, but injury. this artery had gone, and um, it was coming out like a bathroom tap. And you found out later that you actually discovered uh, by one of your colleagues. Yes, um, it was an official escape party. If you tried to escape, of course, you would have been court-martialed and shot. But the regiments had orders. Anyone that can get out, get out of it. And uh, it's an order. Every man for himself. And uh, in my regiment, 15 of them were chosen. They would all be uh, specialists, signalers, surveyors, people like that. And 15 of them set off. One of them found me in the ditch and uh, turned me over and had a good look at me and pronounced me dead. And, uh, which I wasn't actually. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he took both my dog tags off and they tried to get out from Singapore. It's obviously a mistake doing that because you're supposed to leave one with the body for yeah, identification he, he, purposes. That was a very wrong thing to do, to take both my dog tags because one has to stay with the body and the other for the records. He took the two. Mm. And um, they, got, they found a little rowing boat and they got out of the harbour through all the Japanese destroyers and cruisers and all the rest of it. They got out. They had washed their face in tea and their arms as well and they got some black clothes and big hats. Right. And away they went rowing and when he'd been going for a day, a Japanese fighter plane turned up and circled around them three or four times, and they all waved, and after a bit it flew away. Right. And they eventually got to Sri Lanka, six weeks, and um, the first thing, of course, was that they were debriefed. Right. Who do you know was alive when you left, or dead, yes. or wounded? because it was two days before the island fell. And he said, well, Gunnar Ancorn's dead all right. I found him, he was dead in the ditch. Right. And handed in both of those dog tags. So my parents and my fiance, of course, were notified that I'd been killed in action. And that's in their knowledge for the next two years. That was a de devastating news. Obviously, and as you say, two years later that they discovered the truth. In the meantime, you're not dead in the ditch. Um, the next thing you know, you wake up uh, in a hospital. Yes, I woke up in a hospital. Uh, before, before that, actually, uh, as I couldn't bend, I was put on the wing of a lorry. Right. And they tr were driving me to the hospital, but we were under machine gun fire. And uh, I eventually, uh, a, sh a bullet creased my nose, went into the engine of the lorry and stopped it and so we were stuck in the middle of the road being fired at and these fellows had to get me out and drag me across the road these legs weren't working at all at that time and uh, into the Fullerton buildings which has a huge post office long counter as wide as this and in there there was a surgeon operating on battle casualties the place was full of them but as soon as I was in there, I had to be dealt with first because I was losing so much blood, I was about to die, really. <coughs> and the surgeon said to me, um, sorry, son, I can't save your hand. It's got to come off. And I said to him, well, get on with it and save me because I knew I was dying. And he told his orderly to put me out of it, right. which he did just by putting a piece of gauze on here pouring ether on. That's you the worst thing that's, that's ever yeah. happened to me. Oh, can't breathe in or out. I... And the orderly looked at me and said, aren't you the magician we saw in Liverpool? Right. And I said, yes. And he turned to the surgeon and said, you can't cut his hand off, so he's a conjurer. 
The last thing I heard surgeons say, I'll see what I can do. Right. And the next time I woke up, this is the funny part, I kept waking up in different places. <laughs> I don't know how I got to any of them, but there I was. <laughs> Just there, I, you wake up. And I was going in and out of consciousness for two or three days. And when that happens, when you go unconscious, you don't know whether it was 10 seconds or two hours. Right. And in some cases it was hours and minutes. And there I was waking up in the hospital that they intended to take me to in the first place. And uh, there were 71 of us in that ward. Uh, we were being shelled uh, heavily in the hospital because the Japanese had taken over the hospital and our artillery, my regiment, was shelling me. <laughs> and uh, so some fellows were under the beds lying on the floor, others were on stretchers on the floor, and people like me with a bed. <coughs> and that's the time I woke up and found that situation. Right. And when you did wake up, you didn't see the normal doctors you were expecting to see, you saw no, the in uniform. that's right. Well, what happened, I saw the walking wounded walking out of the ward right. in an orderly fashion, not even speaking, one behind the other, and their hands were tied together with barbed wire, and they were tied to each other with barbed wire, and behind them was a Japanese soldier with a rifle and bayonet, and I said to the man on the stretcher, isn't that a Japanese soldier? I'd never seen one. You know, in the artillery, your enemy's three or four miles away. You can knock them all, kill them all, do what you like with them, but you, nothing nasty. You don't even see it. Uh, so I'd never actually seen a Japanese soldier till that moment. And he said, oh yes, he's a Japanese soldier. And I said, what's he doing in here? Damn cheap. You know, it was our hospital. Yeah. And there's a Jack walking through. Oh, he said he's taking those fellows out and killing them on the front lawn. And I remember saying, oh, I see. Yeah, that's as long as I know. Amazing, that's all I said. Oh, I see. Hmm. And then, the next thing, they're coming back in the hospital, wiping the blood off their banners and killing everyone in their beds. All the nurses taken into a hut and killed. Then they came up the ward, killing everybody. And I'm the only survivor. In fact, that day, I mean, it was the Alexandra Hospital, there were 200 people, staff and patients were killed. Yes. Um, why do you think you escaped? Well, <laughs> there again, all the nasty things that happened to me had a good ending, and this was one of them. Because what I, when I heard the surgeon say, I'll see what I can do, I didn't know it, but the chaps came in, and all he did was to tire tourniquet around my arm, not a very good one. So when the Japanese came up the line of beds, I was lying there like this, and blood was pouring out onto me, onto the bed, onto the floor. And when they came to do me, they assumed they'd done it, and went on. And I was the only one left. Incredible. <laughs> so from the hospital, obviously surrounded with bodies and things like that, what happened next? The next time I woke up, I was lying on the floor of a Chinese girl's high school. Uh, As you do. Absolutely. Yes, you would. Yes. <laughs> but I, see, once again, I didn't know how the hell I got there. Right. But there were 15 other wounded people in there. Yeah. And they were all people who couldn't move. Right. And I presume that's how I was in there. How I got there, I don't know, but that's where I was. And, and you remember being taken from there and thrown into a lorry? Yes, um, after went three weeks this happened, right. they decided I was to go up to Changi, where all the prisoners were, 150,000, on a barrack square. Wasn't room for anything. So they got hold of me and threw me in the back of a lorry. I mean, threw, like a sack of potatoes. These bones still poking up out of here. Makes your eyes water. And after 20 miles or so, we got to Changi, where they threw me out onto the pavement in the same way. Bang. And I thought, I've got to find someone that knows me, because right. I'm going to die. <coughs> and I spent two days crawling around, looking 
for someone I knew, crawling, because I got a bullet in the back of the knee there, and this hand wasn't working, and it took me two days to find someone. Who did you find? One of our sergeants, and he, they, they had made a little sergeant's mess in a bungalow that was there, and um, he took me in there. I'll never forget that, because this was in an awful state. I could put two fingers right through my arm and out the other side. Right. And uh, he, he said, come on, old boy. And he went out through the swing doors and let him come back on my arm. Oh! What a, you'd think you would have thought of that, wouldn't you? But that's how I started, uh, really, uh, you know, being made whole again. Right. And life in Changi, there were actually, what, about 140,000, 150,000 other prisoners. Yes. Um, and food was obviously very difficult at that sort of time to find things. Well, we had no food for six weeks. Six weeks <coughs> without food. So when someone says to me, I haven't had anything since breakfast, I'm starving. I want to cut his throat. <laughs> uh, uh, they don't know what starving is. When I came home, I used to lose my temper whenever I saw anyone throwing crumbs to the birds. Right. What I could have done with this. And your chopsticks, which we um, not have, have actually here, this is what you used to, to eat, I mean, with the little bit of food that you got. Yes, I well, you had... when I was first taken, I had no clothes on at all. Right. And um, also nothing to eat with. I didn't even have a plate or a mess tin or anything. And more important than that, I hadn't <coughs> got a water bottle. And I thought, well, I've got to make something. So I made these uh, little chopsticks out of um, a bamboo uh, hedge there. And I knew that I, I couldn't use them at that stage. So you, you might see they're pointed. I so thought, if I can't pick them, I can stab it. Right. And uh, these are 70 years old now. And I still use them every day. Saves on the washing up. Yes. <laughs> well, and actually, I mean, you did get paid during that time, and it was ten cents a day, to, which you had to buy yes. rice. Yes. Um, but I understand that because of the disease that used to happen, caused a lot by the flies. Uh, well, the, the, I love any animal you can think of, or any creepy crawly. I love them all, except flies. I'll kill every last one of them I'll ever see. They were the ones that were killing us. Dysentery. And, and the Japanese, um, they, they said that actually before we get, you get paid, you have to uh, yes. catch a certain number of flies. Isn't well, that right? they realised that uh, everyone had dysentery badly. And so the Japanese decreed that for our 10 cents a day, um, we would have to catch 10 flies and show them the corpses and they would go into an incinerator that we had built there. And when you'd done that, you got your money. Now, when you've got 50,000 people taking 10 flies a day, you're getting rid of the fly population. And that didn't affect the Japanese. You just get no money till we get our 10 flies. Right. The whole object of the thing was to get rid of the flies, but now they weren't paying us because there weren't any. So you actually had to go to nasty places to find flies. For instance, uh, you could get a bit of old stinking fish and put it down and, and wait, because the flies appear instantly. And after that, when there were less flies, the only place was the dysentery latrines. Not nice. And you caught flies there. And there were no flies then. So I thought, well, I'm going to start a fly farm. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it could take you all day to find ten flies. Right. <laughs> so I got a bottle yes. and put some maggots in, and in no time I'd got flies in there. Right. And uh, I, I filled it with these flies. Yes. And so I was s selling them. I, I sold the ten flies to each person for five cents. So they got their money without having to work for it. I got five cents, uh, their money. So I was making quite a good living out of it at that point, uh, breeding flies. Right, and, and even without breeding the flies, yeah. um, you came up with another ingenious way where actually you didn't have to have flies themselves. Well, that was it. Um, 
it got a bit tough. So what I did, well, it wasn't me really. We had an English sergeant, Sergeant Faircloth. Yes. He was in charge of the incinerator. Right. It was about that high, like a pillar box. Yeah. And there was a Japanese guard there. We showed him the thing and he nodded and in they went. Well, now this sergeant thought, well, I want to get in on this racket. You know, why should he get all the money? So he made a flap at the back <laughs> so that when the flies went in, they came out into a box that he was <laughs> holding. So he was able to sell flies then. Um. But the only thing was, after a day or two, that when you showed them to the they could see rigor mortis had set in <laughs> on these flies. They couldn't possibly have been caught that day. Right. Uh, so we had to stop that. But, but you then came up with, rather than just breeding yes, flies and okay. recirculating them, you, you started making flies yourself. Yes, I thought, well, I'll, I'll make flies. And uh, I got an old, there was a lorry tyre. Right. And I cut bits out of it and made these flies. They were big flies. Uh, they were the back end, we, we didn't call them blue-tailed flies, something like that, blue something or other. And they had red faces, big, big red bits. So I got a piece of tyre from a lorry, made a fly, and uh, I got some cello, not cello tape, um, that sort of stuff, I put those on for wings, and then I dipped them in some red palm oil, right. which gave them the red eyes, and then they looked perfect, you know, hand them to the jet, and in they went. How did that work in the incinerator? I mean, rubber and incinerator well, doesn't go so well, does it? two days, the whole camp stunk of burning rubber. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, things were getting a bit naughty. Right. And I tried to sell the flies, but it was a buyer's market. Right, <laughs> right. I, I could imagine. No one would buy any. Right. So I had to get rid of that fly farm of mine. Sure. And uh, <laughs> that was the end of the fly episode. Right, right. You had some interesting characters as well at, at the camp. I mean, you came across um, Searle, I think, uh, at that sort of stage. Um, and, and also, um, when, when did you first come across him? Ronald, Ronald Searle, as you know, the St. Trinian's man. Yes. He was a friend of mine because um, in this country, when they first made the uh, concert party, the army decided to have a divisional concert party. Okay. Not just a few <coughs> fellas having a, a, a bit of fun, yeah. a proper concert party to tour the country and uh, do shows every night. And I was in that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, not much competition for me to get into it. All right. the others were singers and instrumentalists. I was the magician. And uh, so we were in the concert party and Ronald Searle who was uh, a signaller in those days, I think, he came into the concert party and he did all our backdrops for right. us. And uh, I never saw him again in action, but I bumped into him again when we were first prisoners. Right. He's still alive today. Are you still in touch? Uh, I'm in touch, uh, rarely, but he's very frail right. and uh, he's losing his sight and all that. And, um, well, not many of us left. Right. This might be the last time you see me in this theatre. <laughs> But, but also, apart from, uh, there are other performers there as well. Um, do you remember uh, some other magical performances well-known to the magic community? Magic performances? They, did you not have the, the Piddingtons, weren't they, there as well? No. Oh, they weren't? Okay, get rid of them. <laughs> not quite. Where were they? She wasn't there. Right, oh, okay. If she'd been there, there wouldn't have been doing thought reading, I'll yes. tell you. Yes, um, No, Piddington was there. Yes. And I met him... Uh, uh, he's Australian, of course, and we were divided, Australian lines, Dutch lines, and so on. Yes. And uh, what uh, most people never knew, and I suppose I can let out the secret here, that he was a first-class magician. Right. But when he went into his thought-reading thing, a bit like Darren Brown, yes. um, that was the end of his days as a magician. Uh, same with Yuri Geller, of course. So that's where Sid Piddington and but, I... But he was in the camp. He was in the camp with you and, and Searle as well. Yes, we were okay. all in, in Changi at in that Chang, time. Right, right, OK. And do you remember performing with him? That when, was he, you say he was a magician at that stage as well? No, he never performed. Never performed at all? Uh, I think he was in one... Uh, yes, he was in an Australian show. They had a very good producer there, John Wood. Who, right. And that was his uh, job in life, actually. And I remember going through to the Australian lines, 
which could cause trouble if you were caught. And uh, he was doing billiard balls right. beautifully. Yeah. Okay, so there we are. I thought, thought, thought the story was there somewhere. It's yes, good. Yeah. Um, But you weren't going to stay in the camp. What happened is the Japanese uh, felt they, they needed a workforce for, for building uh, a railway. Yes, uh, and you were moved. That's right. Uh, I always regarded myself like an animal because, you know, you get woken up early in the morning and taken to a boat and shushed up the gangway just like sheep. Right. You don't know where you're going. No one telling a thing. Get in there and up. You go all into the boat and away you go. And the same thing happened in Changi. Suddenly the Japs took us down to Singapore Harbour uh, and in our case to the railway. And next thing is we're heading for Thailand or Siam as it was then. Five days in the trucks. Very, very hot. Right in the day, 100, 110, 120, and very cold at night, no room to sit down or lie down, and everybody with dysentery. I will say no more about that. Right. And obviously, uh, we, we spoke about this before, the chronology of what happened next was quite confused, and you get different reports in different publications. Uh, I think you explained last time that the reason for that is that your real focus was not on remembering where you were, but actually just on survival. All I could think of was survive. I had made up, uh, when I went, I said to my fiancé, look, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where I'm going. We were actually scheduled to go to the desert. Right. And as you could see from that picture of the lorry, yes. it's camouflaged with the desert. Yellows, browns, blacks. Didn't half stand out in the jungle, I can tell you. Right. <laughs> and and um, so when we were on about the... You were being shipped over to, to start uh, work on the yes, railways. Yes, the, the Japanese decided to build a, a railway from Bangkok to Mulmin in Burma. And now, between the wars, the, this project had been gone into by several nations to build this, and they all decided it's impossible. The workforce would die, because it was virgin jungle. No one had ever been there before. Right. And... Um, they decided it couldn't be done. Well, the Japanese decided it would be done and they had a wonderful tool, which was slave labor. And it didn't matter to them how many people died right. in their hundreds. Plenty more where that came from. So that was the start of the railway and the famous bridge over the River Kwai. Right. No such place as the River Kwai. Kwai means river. Right. As right. in England we say Avon. That means river. Right. Obviously, you were, at this stage, um, given a uniform, if you like, in terms of clothing. It wasn't very much, but it was uh, something to protect your dignity. I, well, I, I had you... no clothes, as I say, and no water bottle or anything. But eventually, I did get issued with some clothing by the Japanese. I've got it in here. And um, this is all I had for three and a half years. Just the same one. I looked pretty good in it in those days. Uh, <laughs> you wouldn't like to see me now, in it. <laughs> and that's what I had. And um, that's how I started working on the railway uh, at the bridge over the River Kwai. If you've seen the film, it, it's a terrific film, I don't doubt that, but there's not one word of truth in it. It could not possibly ever have happened. Well, which bits did they get wrong? Or which bit did they get right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, nothing. You see, you know Alec Guinness, the colonel. Do you remember that scene where he had a cup of tea and he said to the Jap, perhaps we could discuss this over a cup. His head would have been rolling across the ground before he'd finished the sentence. Right. Don't forget, no Japanese spoke English and none of us spoke Japanese. So um, the, it's a... It couldn't possibly have happened. Nothing like that happened at all. And the bridge was made out of bamboo, I think, in the movie, which wasn't right at all. No, it? that's right. A lot of people think that bamboo bridge was the bridge over the Kwai. It's just like Waterloo Bridge in London. Right. Steel and concrete, and it's as strong today as ever it was. And uh, that's what the bridge... The one they're talking about, there was a bamboo bridge like that, but that was 100 yards down from where that, uh, the main bridge there is. Right. And that was just a service bridge that we used while we were building that. Actually, that photograph you've got there 
is the centre span of the bridge being knocked out by our bombers. And um, I was there on that day. And we had to mend it again. Right, right. Um, during the summer, you, were, uh, you moved camp fairly regularly because every time there was the rail head that you would sort of keep moving every so many days and they'd say... It, uh, yes, it, you would be taken to a point in the jungle and they said, that's where your camp is going to be. You can build the camp after a day's work. And uh, that would be the rail head and that's where you'd be for two or three weeks till it was built up to there and then you move on to another point. Right, and during this time, the Red Cross were able to get certain things through to you, uh, including the uh, ability to send some postcards home. Yes, that's right. Um, suddenly, out of the blue, I think it was a, a Red Cross postcard, we were given a postcard that we could send home. Now, we were not allowed to write anything. We never had pencils, papers, they were all taken away. And with the card that we got, all we were allowed to do was to sign our name on it. Now, um, it was pre-printed, and uh, I see th th you've got it there, and it says such things as your mails uh, received, and you see in brackets I put two little dot things at the end of and, and that says and photo, in Pitman's shorthand. And the next bit there, where it says, I'm in hospital, crossed out. And the next bit is crossed out, and the crossing out there reads, building a railway from Bangkok to Moulmein, in Pitman's shorthand, you can just see it there. And the next line, uh, I am not working, nothing there. And then we were allowed to put five, five names, and this isn't the first one, because on the first card, one of the five names I put was Pittman. Right. And uh, that was my signature as it used to be. Later on it was changed. Right. And you found out um, several years later um, the story from your mother when she received this. Yes. What happened, for two years they had been told that I was dead, and my mother refused to believe it and um, they were allowed to send a card every week with 25 words on that's all and my mother uh, sent one every week she said he might not be a dead and he might get this and she would send these cards off every week that's why I got a few cards most people never got any cards at all and um, she used to send this card with 25 words on it and we were allowed to send another card. When it eventually got to England, it got to my mother, and she said, well, he really is dead. That's not my son's signature. And she took herself off the bed, my name not to be mentioned, you know, and 10 minutes later, she was screeching the house down, he's alive, he's alive. And what she had spotted is um, these these are the crossings up. That one there, you see how easily that would look like a, in the middle, on that last line. That says, don't worry. The top one there says, Canbury Camp. And that's the thing that caused all the trouble, that signature. You can see that it's not the signature we first used. Now, when I was a little baby, they called me Smiler. And when I went off to the war, my mother said, you know, whatever happens, you keep smiling. Right. And she took herself off to bed with this card. She must have sat there just looking at it. That's when she started screaming. The top bit of the F there in Pittman's shorthand, that loop says still. And the squiggle at the end of the G says smiling. So she got the message that I said still smiling. And from then on, she knew I was alive. And it's actually very dangerous, I'm putting this in um, perspective. Oh. If, if you'd been discovered sending coded messages home, what would have happened? Well, the Japanese had divided us into tens. So if someone got into trouble, so did the other nine. So if you were going to escape, you either had to take the other nine with you, or swear 
to them that they wouldn't say anything about it, or you had to stay there. Likewise, if they discovered that code, not only would my head have come off, but so would nine others. Right. And I remember taking my card to the Colonel, the great, wonderful Colonel Tuzi, right. and uh, I said, can you see anything wrong with this card? He said, no, why? I said, look at it. There's a code in there. And he looked at it, and he said, well, I can't see anything. So I said, good, I'm sending it. And off it went. And I had a reply from my mother um, with the usual 25 words. And you see the bit that I've highlighted there. Also still smiling. <laughs> so I knew she'd got the message. And um, at the top there, you, I don't suppose you'll see it very well. At the bottom, you see that bit there in shorthand? I did that in pencil. It says, yippee because I now knew that she was in contact. And when a few months later, this was nine months later, I got that reply, I said to the colonel, it got through, yes. they've got the message. Now, my father was a, a journalist, Fleet Street journalist. And in those days, they had to go to the Ministry of Information every day yes. for a meeting and told what they could print and what they couldn't. And I said to Colonel Tuzi, um, if you like, I can do some cards for you, right. if you can pinch some. And um, any message you want to get back, I will send it to my parents. They will be looking. Right. And Colonel Tuzi said, no, Uncle, I'm not having you risk your life for me. He said, I've got contacts in the war office. So if you do, I, I can tell you what I want put on there and I will send it to the War Office right. via my contact. And that's what we did. And to this day, I don't know whether it ever got through. And if it did, did they know what to look for? Right. So they would have known nothing about it, but it was there. I'd love to go through their archive and see if it's there. <laughs> In the camp, obviously, there's, there's a lot of different talent, many people from different walks of life. And it was trying to get those memories from home, apart from the letters and things like that. Um, you obviously had um, a photograph of uh, your fiancé. Yes. And uh, one, one of the, the creative people there um, turned into a watch, I understand. Well, that's an amazing thing. Uh, I was on what was called a Mackie party. Mackie is the Japanese word for firewood. And you could go out looking for firewood. Uh, you had to find dead wood. You can't burn green bamboo. And you could go to the Japanese guardhouse, they would give you a little woolen, wooden billet, and off you'd go to the jungle. We never had a fence around our camp, nowhere to go. 2,000 miles of virgin jungle, where are you going to go? Now, I loved the jungle. A lot of people say the green hell, best place I've ever been, wonderful. So it was like the flies. Right. After a few days, it's harder and far harder to find wood. So I used to get out of the camp early and go off into the jungle, find the wood and bury it like a dog. Right. And I'd take a note of where I'd buried it. Then I'd spend the whole day in the jungle on my own. And uh, absolutely wonderful that was. And on my travels one day, I found the bezel of a watch. That's the chromium bit that you can see there. No works, no glass, no strap, no nothing. But I thought, well, I wonder if that would fit the photograph that I've got of my fiancé. And it did. So I stuck it in there. I made the strap out of a, an army shirt collar, put a buttonhole and a button. And that used to dangle loose on my wrist. And there's no glass there. And uh, I have that here as well. It is. Oh, by the way, look at the size of my wrist. That used to dangle loosely on my wrist. And there it is. It's as good today as the day that photograph was taken. It's been on my wrist through monsoon, through mud and all sorts of foul things 
and it's as good as it was then. No glass, nothing. So that's 70 years old as well. Amazing, isn't it? I mean, you talk about the very hard working conditions and things like that, and there was a particular time when you were uh, heading to creosote, what the, uh, the thing which has been built, and obviously you were still very much suffering from the injuries which you had sustained with the bombing. That's right. Well, uh, due to the bombing, a certain part of the brain that deals with balance was damaged by the blast in those bombs. And as a result, I had vertigo very badly, and it only has got worse ever since. That's why I need the stick. I have no balance at all now. When we built that bridge, it's the only time, by the way, we had elephants to help us. It was right. teak that we were making it out of. Every joint, we put a little box of termites in with it. <laughs> and, well, we hoped that they would eat the bridge when we'd gone. The termites like teak. No, I found out two years ago they don't like tea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Somebody do too hard for their teeth. That's right. Uh, but when we put this up, it wasn't a bridge, it was a viaduct yes. right round the top of a mountain. And we had to blast the mountain away with dynamite mm -hmm. and then put the bridge up. It's the best part of a mile. It's still there, you can go over it on a train at five miles an hour, uh, it sways a bit. And uh, when it was up, we had to creosote it. Yes. Now, in that temperature, we worked in, in that temperature all the time. I never ever heard anyone complain about the heat. It was 100, 110, 120. We just, just like animals. But if you've got a spot of that creosote on your hand, blister came up straight away. And uh, the Jap guard told me to climb up and creosote it. Yes. Now we had a five gallon tin of creosote, very, very heavy. And of course I had no hand to carry it with. For five years I had no hand. So the only way I could carry anything was on here. Right. And he told me to get up and climb up and creosote it. Well, Due to the bullet in my knee, I have a dropped foot to this day, and uh, the only way I could is, is this movement that I'm doing. I can't possibly do it with that one, but I'm trying now. Right. And so the only way I could get around, I had a rope tied round my foot, and um, I used to pull it up to walk. As a matter of fact, I've just noticed, you see at the bottom of that shoe there, there's a little D ring which I had put in a long time ago and I had an elastic band going up through here and onto a bit of rope round my waist and under the shirt. I say that because last time I was examined by a doctor, he said, what's the rope for? <laughs> but um, that was the only way I could move that. So I told the guard, I can't do it. Yes. All in sign language, you understand that. So he went and got a bamboo pole to beat me up with. So um, I started climbing with vertigo. Right. And so what I would do, I have this very heavy creosote, I didn't want to spill any on me, get hold of something there, lift this foot up with the rope and go up like that. It took me about a half an hour to get up to the 100 feet up there. And then when I got there, oh, I didn't mention, uh, that day I'd found a hat. Right. Yes, it was a banana leaf hat. When I got to the top, I just hung on to the bridge and shut my eyes. I, the whole world was spinning around. How, how high was this? About 100 feet. 100 feet high. Mm. And uh, I, I couldn't move. Right. And he was shouting at me from down there. And, and I said, no, you know, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't open my eyes. Uh, if God had told me to get on with it, I would have said no. Uh, and so the result of that was he came flying up after me, right. um, like a monkey, 35 seconds. And he threw the whole of the five gallons of creosote over me. And immediately I came up like the Michelin man. Uh, you could see all the things coming up. The hat saved my face because I put my head down. And I was telling this story a few years ago in Singapore 
where I had gone with a party of about 10 other ex-prisoners of war. And I was telling this particular story. Yes. And I said to them at the end, I never found out right. whether I actually fell off the thing into the river or whether I managed to get down. All I remember is waking up in the river, being washed down by the other fellows. And a man on that night said to me, no, you didn't fall, we carried you. Right. And he'd been on the bridge that day and I met him for the first time. And they'd carried me down somehow, uh, horribly burned, and washed me down. Right. Now, just like all the other things, uh, the massacre, and all, all good for me, because the Japanese could see what state I was in, so they put me to go down country. Right. And I went to my friends who I'd been working with and said, well, I'll see you around when I get better. And uh, my particular friend, said, you won't see us again. And I said, why not? He said, we'll all be dead. And they were three weeks later. So if I hadn't had the burns, I would have been with them. That, that was Lester Martin, who was your Lester friend. Martin, a very good friend of mine. And uh, he was right, they were all dead. And he was the fittest man, the fittest prisoner <coughs> ever. Right. He was a county cricketer in England. Right. And because, as you say, because of the horrific injuries, you couldn't work. But that, no. that actually gave rise to surviving yet again because you got moved to a different camp. Which camp was this? Chunkai. Right. And that was turned into a hospital camp. When I say hospital, it was still grass huts and things like that, but it was used for uh, hospital purposes. And I was there for about eight months. And actually, again, food was an issue, but your skills as uh, a magician came to the fore again. Well, this is the great thing because the camp commandant there was a bit of a magic buff and he'd seen me practicing magic to try and get it left-handed because this one wasn't working. And uh, he sent for me to do magic. And so I, I went in there and he said, you know, get on with it. And I said, no, you know, I haven't got anything. I, I had the loincloth, that's it. So, all in sign language. So, he said, you speak. So, on his table, there was a tin of fish. So, I borrowed a coin off him and banished it. Then opened the tin of fish and took out the coin. So, I got to eat the fish. <laughs> because they wouldn't touch anything that we had touched. We were verminous. And those fish full of vitamins, of course, and protein. Right. So I was getting those down me. So the next time I was sent for to him, there were no fish around, but he got some bananas there. Right. So I did the trick, which I suspect you all know, where he took a card. I remember it was the Four of Hearts. And I picked up all the bananas, made quite certain that I touched them all. <laughs> and, and pulled one off and asked him to peel it, and it right. dropped off in four pieces. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So I got the bananas, bun full of vitamins. So all this was my way of trying to survive. And then, uh, shall I tell the ultimate trick? I, I, well, they had a very special guest, and uh, Osato asked you to perform a very special performance for, for this honoured guest. Yeah, he Japanese. had a general coming, and he asked me to do some magic that night, and I said, I can't, I've got nothing. And then he said, that you speak. So I said, well, an egg. Now an egg, three months' pay. So he wrote on a little chitty, gave it to me, and I took it down to the Japanese cookhouse. And I gave it to right. the cook sergeant or whoever he was, and he looked at it and asked me what I wanted. All in sign language, you know. So I thought, what can it say? Right. It obviously can't say one egg. So I said, 50 eggs. <coughs> and he gave me a year's salary of eggs. And we went back to the hut and made a 
50 egg omelet. Right. <laughs> and uh, even the egg that I needed for the trick, you know, the one with the silk hanky in the egg. So I had to remake the egg. Right. And I, had, I cut a little hole in the back of it with a thorn from a bamboo, and that went in the omelet. And then there was a K-pop tree growing nearby, and I picked some K-pop off, put it, dipped it in some red palm oil, that went in the egg, that looked like the yolk, and some coconut oil, albumin, and I stuck the thing on. And um, I did the trick that night. You know the uh, silk in the egg and the fake explanation. And um, it went very well. And uh, the next day I was summoned into the hut, small hut, and he was glowering, looking down. Normally he would uh, nod like that when I came in, mm. friendly. That's as friendly as you got, but it was better than nothing. But on this occasion, he was just glowering. Right. And I thought, what's going on here? I'm in trouble. And then I looked and there on his table was the chitty he'd given me the day before. And he said, you do magic with one egg. Where 49 eggs. Right. Well, I, know, I am now dead. I have one second left to live. Because they always had a sword there. Right. I just stood there with my knees knocking. And I knew I was going to die. And at a time like that, you've got to do something or think something or say something. And I remember looking at the side of the hut there, which was a, a bit of a, it made from a rice sack. And I'm examining the weave. Because I know, I'm, I know it's, in a minute, I'm out. Out of my mouth, I don't know who put it in there, but out it came. Your show was so important. I was rehearsing all day long. <laughs> and he just went like that and let me go. And I don't know whether he knew damn well, right. but it was enough to save his face, or whether he fell for it. But I didn't die, and I should have done all that. It would have been beheaded. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And, but, but also the brutality, which is covered extensively in a number of publications, which will come to you. Um, and it wasn't, and this is what I found the most shocking, it wasn't just the Japanese, but actually um, what we call the Red Hats, which was our, our own side. Red, red caps. caps, yes. The Royal Military Police are called Red Caps, as you know, they have a red bit. Yeah. And in Chunkai camp, they had a hut which was their headquarters. Yes. This is in a Japanese prison of war camp. And they were going out on patrol each day in the camp. And of course their main job was to stop people bartering their clothes or whatever. And the Japanese didn't like it either. But they would be wandering around. And there were these fellows, 15 stone if they were an ounce. So they had the uh, means of getting food from somewhere or the other. And they used to stroll around in their uniforms, pressed, starched shorts, red caps and everything. And they looked as brutal as they did when we were in Norfolk. And uh, they used to go around and get hold of somebody who had been caught doing something he shouldn't. And that night in the hut, they would beat the living daylights out of him with sticks and stones and God knows what. And I was quite near that hut, and you, it was like the Gestapo, you could hear the, the torturing going on. And these are our troops, and our prisoners. And um, it was run by a sergeant, called Sergeant Dow. I'd like to meet any of his relatives if they're here. And an officer called Captain Burns. And to my mind, it was just like uh, a Nazi torture camp. And what do you think the motivation was for that? Because these are our troops They're beating our up. Well, of course, they were surviving, weren't they? They got full of food and they were carrying out their duties. The Japs had left it to our people to see that discipline was maintained and they took it to the nth degree. And to be caught by our red caps doing something wrong, like being caught by the Japanese. Right. 
I mean, mostly if we ever found someone doing something that you get done for, you'd tell him to, you know, get out of the way. Something. No, no, it was a horrible thing. The final camp that you went to uh, was Ubon. Um, and there it was basically a different sort of facility where you had a, an aerodrome as such. Um, tell me about that. Well, the camp itself? Yes. Well, uh, it was a well-run camp, uh, and conditions were pretty good, and we could do much as we wanted to, and we were given the chance of having a football pitch and a basketball pitch, uh, which is what we did. And it, the fellow who marked it out, marked it out a normal football pitch with the centre in the middle and the gold posts, marked it out with ashes. Right. Now, I don't know how he thought of this, but he thought, as we were being bombed regularly by our own planes, there should be a sign for the RF to know that it was a POW camp. Yes. And you mentioned, just before we come on to that, about the bombing, and just before the bombing, as you say, it was a, a prime target, and I think the Japanese used to put you, and put prisoners, right in the middle where yes. the prime target was. Uh, in the hope that the RF would know that we were there and they wouldn't be bombed. Right. But they had to be, so we were always in the... And, and one particular air raid that you had, um, you well, had the that bombing... Is, that is the most amazing thing you've ever seen. Um, one night I came out of the hut to empty my swill. Yes. On a lovely <coughs> summer's evening, about seven o'clock, and uh, I was the only one out there was another man walking along somewhere and uh, of course we never had air raid warnings right. no such thing as radio or telephone or anything. so when there was an air raid someone had to hear them coming and raise the alarm well on this occasion um, everyone was in the huts finishing their rice and uh, I looked up and there were 27 liberators coming right up the middle of the camp. Now, as I have hinted, that the worst fear that I can ever <coughs> think of is being bombed. Right. It terrifies me, because I've been bombed on so many occasions. You know, you see the History Channel on the box, and you see these planes right. and all the bombs. I know what, I know what it's like. And uh, on this occasion, there were these bombers, and I thought, my God, they've got it wrong. Uh, they, they think this is the Jap camp and uh, it was too late to do anything. They were flying slowly, you know, like this and I could see the propellers even turning. At that moment another person jumped in the trench with me. I remember his name, Captain Stone, he was a doctor. And I looked up and in the leading bomber I could see a man lying down, looking at me, and I could see his thumb. And then I saw his thumb do that. I could see all that. And I saw all these bombs, hundreds of them, coming towards us. Once again, for the fourth time, I said, I'm dead. And then, suddenly, the bombs started to drift sideways. Never seen anything like it. I didn't realise they would work all this out. And so the bombs were drifting away from where we were into the Japanese camp, which is no further away than that wall. And at a time like that, you have two sorts of people. One person must look, the other person can't. You know when a cat's being traced by a dog, it goes around the corner and stops and looks back to see how it's getting on. Right. Well, I'm the sort that has to look at what's coming to me. And he wasn't. And I saw these bombs heading for the Japanese camp. And I said, you've got to look at it. You must look. We're all right. right. The bombs are going into Hashimoto's. And we looked. And at that moment, five loose bombs came out of that bomber right across the camp. And uh, I was buried alive. The bomb landed on the side of our trench. Now, 
Within three minutes, they dug us out unhurt. It was sandy soil. Everyone was out. The huts were on fire and God knows what. And as we got out, um, the planes were coming in again for another run in with incendiary bombs to set the whole lot on fire. And I remember this uh, Captain Stone said, get back in the trench. Lightning never landed in the Touched center twice, of fire. So it was hard to get in. It was full of rubble. And I remember digging like a dog. <laughs> and I had this vision of me lying, not, you, we couldn't get in properly, it was full of rubble. And I had the vision of me in there with my bottom out. And I could see it being sliced in, oof, you know, a horrible feeling. I just want to get that down out of the way some way. Never could. But um, we got two incendiary bombs in the trench on that occasion. So it shows you how close we were to the... And, and as a result of that, as you say, you used to mark the football pitches in a certain way. You tried to pass on a, a message to the pilots um, to, to, to point out where you were. How did well, you do that? Well, the fellow that marked it out... Which is, can I just explain about that picture? If you see all the stuff up there, that's not jungle. That's bombs bursting. So you can imagine the noise. That's why I wear these hearing aids. And can you see the five loose bombs? I'm under that one. That's the one I'm under. This goes back to ten years after the war. Right. We used to go to hospital every year for <coughs> tropical diseases. And uh, there I met the bomb aimer who dropped those bombs. And he had that photograph under his pillow. It's ten years after the war. Right. And I said, uh, what have you got that there for? He said, well, you don't know how difficult it was for us. It was an eight-hour flight from India. All the way, we had to think we've got to try and miss our lads. And if we made a bad job of it, we had eight hours fly back, think about it. So we always worried. And he said, that raid where I'd done such good bomb aiming, I never know how many of our lads I killed. Right. And I said, well, I can tell you. You killed 13 and you buried two. And I'm one of them. <laughs> and uh, he said, in that case, this belongs to you. And he uh, took that photo from under his pillow. And I said, what have you got that for? He said, well, I've always been troubled about that day. Now I know the truth of it. It's taken the hex away. So you have it. So I've got a photograph at home of me being buried alive by a bomb given to me by the man who dropped the bomb. Quite, quite extraordinary those sort of coincidences. I mean, you are also just touching on um, the warning that you used to give them afterwards in that uh, rather ingenious way they would mark out football <coughs> pictures. Yes. Um, but they managed to also pass on a sign to the pilots to tell them that you were there. Yes, what happened? We, we were allowed to put a... Um, uh, football pitch, pitch up and a uh, basketball pitch and the fellow who marked it out marked it out with ashes fr from, the, from the rice where we were. so he had this complete football pitch marked out in ashes how he thought of this I don't know but in certain places instead of the two layers of ashes he's got to put six layers and uh, he made a message out of it I think we can see, see that with um, so the managed state. So fr from the sky, from the, the sky. intention was that you could see this as POW. POW. And you can see it's all part of the marking of a football pitch. And those bits there, he put more ashes than anywhere else. And I saw him do that. And on parade, we were standing there. It's the most horrible feeling, standing there with that damn great sign, wondering why no one else has seen it. A lot of our fellows didn't know about it. And after the war, I met an RAF pilot and I said, uh, why did the Japs not see that sign? Because their aerodrome was just at the end of that. He said, well, that's your lucky thing because at the moment they're there, they've got too busy to look anywhere else except their runway, they're on their finals. So they would never have seen it. But the RAF flying higher up would have got the message. Right. Yeah. Right. Quite, quite ingenious. Um, 
what happened near the end is uh, the end of war was declared. And um, unfortunately, it wasn't the end of your journey then because uh, your captors wanted to take steps to get rid of you. Oh, yes. Uh, we didn't know at the time, but the war was coming to an end. We, we didn't know. We assumed the Japanese were winning. We assumed we'd never live long enough to see the end of it. But they had been given specific orders that if any ally put one foot on Japanese soil, every prisoner of war was to be liquidated without trace. And they had uh, given them methods of how they could do it. They could get us in a cave and flame throws in there, or they could march us out to the sea and machine gun us. Or in our case, in my camp, they were going to get us on parade for Tenko accounting and machine gunners. And so we, we had started building this, uh, digging this mass grave for us. And uh, <coughs> halfway through the digging of that grave, the Japanese changed their mind and made us dig it round the camp, a moat. Right. So we couldn't get out when we were being killed. And at that time, I thought to myself, well, if after the war anyone should discover this mass grave, they won't know I'm in it. Because, you know, and I had a Dutch friend there, a young chap called Jack Beat, B-I-E-T, and his father was a jeweler, and he said, I'll make you a dog tag. And he made me a dog tag there it is, in the same sort of shape as the underground logo. And he scribed it with all my details on it, with a nail which he sharpened. And then he made a bangle, he made that, with no fastening on it. So once again, that was hanging loose on my wrist. My wrist was about that size. And the, all the details were on there. Now, I normally bring all these things up and lay them out for you to look at. But of course, tonight, we've got the book with all these pictures in there. And you can see the wonderful job that he did scribing the details on there. It looks as if it had come from a jeweler's shop, like my father. Right. And, and you mentioned, I mean, that there is several books. And uh, we could talk all night. And that we are, time is unfortunately against us. What, what I wanted to mention there, you've been the subject of several publications. We, um, a few years ago, when you were last here, I think about four years ago, uh, we did Surviving by Magic. It's now got bigger and better, as indeed has the title of the book, which has got the longest title I've ever seen in any book ever, called Captivity, Slavery and Survival as Far East POW, um, The Conjurer on the Kwai. Uh, and we are honoured indeed today to uh, have in the audience the author of this, um, Peter Fyans. Is, is there a big round of applause for Peter? Is. And Fergus, um, I understand it's not, not a dealer den, but you will be signing copies of this. We've got a few copies downstairs. Yes, we can both sign, can't we? You can, you can both sign that as well. Copies in the demand room. A huge amount of stories, and we could chat all night about Don't several more. Don't think I'm trying to get money out of it. It doesn't come to us at all, does it? I get it all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it works on that sort of basis. But, but Fergus, just to finish with, and there are huge amounts of stories, a lot of which are covered in the book as well. How would you like to be remembered? Well, I've always thought of myself as a, an animal being driven to do things, which I did without complaining. And I've always thought I'm a peace-loving person. I just want to live a peaceful life, which I do. And um, I like people, if they thought about me, to think, well, that was a good way of seen through life. Fergus Ankle. Well, <laughs> well, you know, the farthing. I do. Uh, did my lovely fiancé wait for me? Because I asked her to, didn't I? And of course they'd been told I was killed in action. All her friends, the other nurses, said, you'd better get yourself married, you'll be on the shelf. And she said, well, no, he, he asked me to wait. So uh, that's what I'm going to do. And during that time, she turned down five proposals of marriage. And when I came home, there she was. 
with her half farthing. And I said to her, well, I'm very sorry I lost my half farthing, but I brought me back. It was the first time we'd ever looked at that farthing. I don't know whether the jeweller was a swine or whether it was just an accident. Her bits had the first four letters of the word farthing on it. <laughs> <laughs> I will leave it there. Fergus Anglon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Fergus. Thank you very much.